Welcome to Small Spark Theory. This podcast is designed as a collection of thoughts, ideas and practical tips on using marginal gains to help your agency new business endeavours. Small Spark Theory is created and hosted by me, Lucy Mann of Gunpowder Consulting. Welcome back to Small Spark Theory. I am delighted to be bringing this episode to you today. I've been talking to a number of listeners and some of my clients who've been wanting me to do an episode on developing existing client relationships. And I was a little bit stuck because I wasn't quite sure who to invite to Small Spark Theory to talk about this. So now here I am. I'm sitting in a lovely office in Liverpool. Small Spark Theory is on tour this month and uh, talking to Ian Johnston. Now Ian and I worked together at an agency group some years ago and together we rolled out some client development planning and process across the agency group with fantastic results. So who better to talk us through developing client relationships than Ian Johnston. Welcome Ian. Thank you Lucy. I'm really pleased that you're here and that we're having the opportunity to talk about this. Now I know that when we started working together in 2008 I think you already had a fairly varied career in a number of different industries and and as I talk to you today we're sitting in a law firm, an international law firm in Liverpool and you're working here as COO. I wonder if for the listeners you could just tell us a little bit about your career to date and what brought you here. Uh, Yeah, very good, delighted to. I guess it's a very varied career. I've been variously described, but the positive descriptions have been around a a serial entrepreneur. I've started and grown and brought to market a number of businesses across a range of sectors, including marketing communications, as you've mentioned, Mm -hmm. originally in technology in the 90s, over a period of time in publishing, international property development, and more recently, as you've mentioned, in the legal services sector. Mm. The one common denominator for all of those organisations has been people, and so virtually all of them were people businesses, and the majority uh, either started out as or ended up as fast growth organisations, and and really that's why I'm, I'm here today. It's interesting because my observation is that a lot of the value that you add to businesses, this is my observation, is that you are very good at building in process. And certainly when we worked together, that was a bit of a, a game changer for me because I'd, I'd never worked in that way before. And it made a huge, huge difference. And building a process for client development was something in particular that we worked on and rolled out across the agency group with some fantastic results. And Since then, I've been working with a number of clients and helping them with that client development process. My experience is that even those agencies who might be overly reliant on a small number of of big clients don't have a particularly good process for client development. And then there are other agencies that are very much focused on lead generation and prospecting, but also don't seem particularly proactive and process driven around the client development piece and I wondered what your experiences were in different industries and if there are any particular industries that are better at it than others. I mean every industry has areas that seem Mm. to work and and methods that seem to to work better than others. I think there's a couple of drivers around the need for process and it may not seem relevant to everybody but actually I learned a lot of this from some quite senior uh, salespeople in IT, technology related business, and also in uh, pharmaceuticals. Okay. And you're kind of thinking, well, what's the common denominator there? And the reality is these are businesses where they were typically selling minimum low six figure and often seven or even eight figure projects to major international organizations. And as a result, they'd worked out that every 1% improvement in the effectiveness of their business development activity or their client development activity could actually have a big impact on Mm. on the bottom line. So having put a lot of time and effort and money into it, some of these industries, which during the 90s when I sort of cut my teeth in this area, they were really sort of looking at the science of business development and client development. And a lot of what I learned, I learned early on during that period. 
the industries that therefore have done it best are those that have applied a little bit of out of the box thinking yeah. or or really tested themselves to do things differently. Yeah. So where there's a lot of money at stake, there's a lot of pressure on that. And where there's a very competitive market, again, there's can we be slightly better the competition? Because if we are scoring 51 every time and the competition is scoring 49 every time, we're going to win every time. Yeah. And those small margins make a big difference. I think your observation about process is really important. Mm. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons why I've made that sort of the heart of, of what I do with organisations. The first, as I mentioned, I work very much with growth organisations and mm. having grown a few companies myself, what you, you what you realise very quickly is you cannot sustainably grow a business if you're having to do everything yourself. So you need a, an approach to client development in particular that you can scale and one that doesn't require you. Now, in order for that to happen, there has to be a simple process, a methodology, and it's got to be so easy that anyone can get it quickly. So that's the first thing. The second reason for process is is I have this phrase you've got to you've got to bake client development in mm. to whatever you're doing. It's no good. Okay, we've got a few hours this afternoon, or we've got a quiet week. Let's go and do some client development. Yeah, yeah. we we'll, we have a run at that. Then we get busy again, and mm. it all stops. Mm. It has to be baked in as part of literally every day's activity. Mm. So good process not only makes it scalable, but also bakes it in so you can carry on doing it. You know, for weeks and months. Yeah. I guess one of the things that occurred to me when we were going through that process was that by baking it in, it loops back to new business again, doesn't it? Because if you, as part of your onboarding, if you start managing client expectations around the relationship for the beginning, from the beginning of the relationship and the fact that you are going to be following up things in a particular way and you are going to be coming back to them and reviewing activity and what have you, then then that expectation is already there. It makes it easier to be able to do that with clients. That It, it, it does. And it, I think it's more than that. It, it's If you're of a number of organisations competing in a business development or a new business development situation, competing for the client's attention and work, they'll have a number of anxieties and reservations about what it's going to be like to work with you. If you're the one that's thought through how you're going to work together in terms of client development, mm. you've got a good sense of what the process is, the engagement, the interaction, the KPIs, the measures of success, and you lead with that in the original new business process, you're kind of overcoming one of those key anxieties yeah. right at the start. But yeah. you can only do that sincerely yeah. if you know what it's going to look like yeah. once they're a client. You've already got that process there. I wonder what the the top three tips would be that you would give for anybody that is starting out in that client development planning and process approach who at the moment has just been delivering for clients as we we've both seen in a lot of agencies new business can go on the back foot because it's not billable time and they're so busy delivering work for clients that they haven't thought forward to be able to think okay what potentially could we do for that client what would be your top three tips for starting out Uh, I think my top three tips would actually be the same in many sectors but they are Mm. particularly relevant in the agency world okay particularly relevant The, the first would be keep it really simple yeah so to illustrate that one of the things we worked on together 10 years ago mm. now, is the idea that many of our uh, our agencies in our group had client development plans already and like most client development plans they were large documents with lots of sections and appendices and mm. people who contributed to them and, and they were works of beauty mm. but because they were so large and, and, and well crafted the virtually only time they were useful was to give to somebody new at induction so they had all the background and so on. But because they were so cumbersome, they were normally filed in a drawer and forgotten about yeah. as soon as they'd been agreed. So so keep it simple is definitely the, the sort of first principle. I, I work on the philosophy, if you can't get it on one page of A4, yeah. or these days one screen, Yes. yes. Um, then you're probably doing too much. And, and there's a number of reasons for that. Firstly, the simpler it is, the easier it can be up to date. It can be a living and breathing document or page on your screen, which means it's, 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 it's relevant, it's current, and it moves with what's going on at the time. And secondly, 
as soon as it goes beyond a simple few bullet points, numbers, key ch challenges or next actions arising, it loses its value. And the value of any client development plan, for example, is it drives action. And that would be my second principle, really, mm. is, is, is we talked about baking process in, but baking regular actions that actually directly contribute to the result. So if the first one is keep it simple, the second one is focus on doing something, focus yeah. on action. Yeah. And again, a simple client development plan that drives action daily and weekly is worth infinitely more than a fantastic plan that people return to every three months. Yeah. Okay. And I guess thirdly is once you've got a simple plan and it has got a bias for action, I would talk to the client about it because the client often either directly and clearly or or, or even indirectly and, and might take, take a bit of teasing out, but they'll often know what they want. Now, maybe once you've done one and two, got a really simple plan, you know what actions you want to take. Mm. And maybe you have to guide the client to the right answer of how we're going to work together, what level of review we're going to have, how often we're going to meet, are we going to do it through an app or are we going to face-to-face -face meetings, whatever it might be. Mm. So my third kind of core principle was, you know, the more you talk to the client and ask them, yeah. the more likely you are to optimise your approach for what's going to work for them. So you don't, like in any agency environment, you don't just take what the client says as a given, yeah. you challenge it and tease it and move it in the direction you want to. But once you've done a simple process that's got a bias for action in it and you've agreed it with the client, you've kind of removed all the excuses. And I guess on that third point as well, by involving the client in that process and having that conversation, again, it's that brilliant step of having those conversations with your client outside of the day-to-day -day delivery of a project or of the work itself, which often gets so overlooked. It does, and that's often the time when you take the client back to their business objectives or mm. their market objectives rather than, have we got this job done? Yeah. And that's when you get the real understanding and that's when you spot the next job and that's yeah. when you, you make yourself stickier as an agency. Yeah. And can work with the client, you know, on a higher level, more strategic advice rather than just tactical answers tactical. to problems. Great, thank you. You've been doing this for many years now. Yes, thank um, you. I won't say how many, <laughs> um, but I'm wondering whether you, if you've got any particular examples of particular successes or where you've seen this sort of process being implemented and, and really seen some fantastic results maybe without naming any names without naming any names well okay so I'll refer to the one that you've referred to without naming mm, names okay. but an agency group where we 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 took originally there were 17 different agencies in the group yep. and all had a different approach but and what we didn't do was come along and tell them how they needed to do it but mm. what we did was we invited them to sort of follow us on a journey of of simplifying what they were doing putting a bit of process in and starting to measure the results and then fine-tune them on an iterative basis. And a couple of things happened. The first is that that sort of methodology allowed us to, to get more useful action happening rather than huge amounts of sometimes not very useful action. Uh, and that was a step in the right direction. Now, these were already successful agencies, let's mm. put it in perspective. Yep. But we did manage to drive uh, revenue growth from, from existing clients quite significantly. That same methodology, uh, if we recall, uh, took the genuine new business flow, so the cold new business wins, from an annual run rate of about 4 million to about 11 million over a space of a couple of years. Now, yeah. that's, that's moving the dial. Yeah. Um, so, so that that's one example. Um, uh, another uh, might be uh, there was a technology business I was involved in, um, where it was a very very competitive market. It was kind of what you'd call high end decision support systems. Oh wow! <laughs> but effectively, it was selling people's time to yeah. consult with clients and help them come up with better ways of understanding their markets and their consumers and so on. And there we again just they had a very it was a operating in many countries around the world but it was a very complex and frankly quite expensive sales and marketing engine that they had and clients often were were won and then forgotten about so we just introduced this simple client development methodology and it really was you know one page even for a million dollar account if you yeah. like um, and as a result, we managed to quite significantly improve the revenues from existing clients. 
and managed, uh, it's not always a pleasant thing, but managed to do that with much less resource than we'd had before. And that was a business imperative. Right. So revenue slightly up, cost a lot down. And again, it, it was just down to one, two, three, as we discussed before, simple plan, some action that brings results, and then talk to the client about it. Great. I think the interesting thing about this is that, I mean, this whole series has been around marginal gains. Small Spark Theory is an application of marginal gains for agency growth. And often it's quite difficult to be able to show how some of those small changes can actually have measurable impact. But, But these are all brilliant examples about how by just adding that little bit of process and by just having those extra conversations, more meaningful conversations with clients, how you can make considerable impact on the bottom line. A great example would be one of the changes that we've, we've made in a number of the businesses I've worked in has been we just get everybody doing one extra thing once a week, yeah, probably, once a day if they've got the time. And this is everyone in the team, even at very junior level, even very junior people can be helping with a client development plan that says, well, there's another division over there we're not working with at the moment. How do we get into that? Yeah. So if the team has that as part of the plan, it's on one page or one screen, yeah. um, even a very junior person, particularly with the tools available now, can do a bit of research online, find out a bit about the, the division, maybe find out and press releases and so on, bring that back to the, the team who's looking at client development the next week. And some of that stuff, 15 minutes here and there, once a week, adds up. So a team of eight people, directly or indirectly involved in a client doing something once a week yeah so 50 odd extra bits of activity for eight people suddenly there's 400 in the course of a year little things that will move that client forward that's 400 things if you do it religiously yeah that we wouldn't have done otherwise yeah those 400 little things all add up tiny little changes in their own right but suddenly you look back a year later and you wonder why everything's going so well wondering whether there is a particular book or a film or a TED talk or an inspiring person that you like to kind of recommend or pass on that would be useful for our listeners. I actually go back to something I read a very long time ago and it's not very trendy these days to talk about professors at business school and so on but Professor Michael Porter of Harvard Business School who wrote a series of books I'm guessing late 70s, early 80s, around competitive advantage and and competitive strategy, which to this day have been, for me, right at the heart of how you work either with your own business or agency or you help your clients understand their marketplace. Mm. And the books are in print. Uh, And in fact, I actually met Michael Porter when I was when I was an grad- undergraduate oh, applying did you? for jobs. He actually offered wow. me a job, which wow. was very flattering in his consulting business. But what struck me was the clarity of thinking and the objectivity that, that those books bring to looking at any market. Mm. And, and one of the things that I would recommend you know, even junior people do in, mm. a, in an agency where you've got a team together, you're looking either pitching for a new client, yeah. so you're doing those early, that early research time, or you've got a major client and you want to grow it, yeah. is, is get them to at least read a chapter or two of yeah. competitive advantage yes. and ask them to come back and say, right, you know, what is the client's status in their marketplace? What are the five forces applying to them in terms of the pressures on them and, and the competition, what they're doing? What's the supply and demand situation with their raw materials and so on? And in and of itself, this sounds like pretty kind of boringy, businessy stuff. But when you've worked through that and you can get a really junior person just to do a bit of research, what you actually understand much better in a more structured way is the specific current circumstances of your client. Mm-hmm what the pressures are that they're facing, and then you can start to talk to them about those strategic pressures they face rather than talking to them about something entirely tactical. Yeah. And my experience is the agency that understands the client's business from a strategic point of view, understands the pressures and the dynamic and the drivers of demand that they're facing, yeah. is going to be way ahead of those that are just trying to answer the brief. Yeah. And what we saw in, and I remember we were using Michael Porter's uh, thinking when we were we were running those client development sessions, and it really does give you that ability to be able to change the conversation from a project conversation to a business conversation. Absolutely. And move you from a supplier 
to a trusted advisor and move the dial on that. You, you know you're succeeding when you're in a competitive pitch and they ask you to pause and they run out of the room and they go and grab somebody from the C-suite to come and take part in the conversation. You kind of think, okay, that's this is moving in the right direction. Yeah. And that's the sort of conversation you want to be having. And I'm interested over your career in what's the piece of advice that you've been given that stuck with you the most? And that's where I struggle because... I, I, I learn everywhere I go mm. and, and virtually everywhere I've been and everyone I've worked with, I, you pick something up from. Mm-hmm. I had a mentor in the 90s mm-hmm. and he he had a couple of bits of advice, one of which you've already heard. And, mm. and his, his advice was was keep everything really simple. Yeah. And as I've been involved in fast growth businesses, the more complex you make stuff, the more difficult it gets to manage. So keep everything really simple. So on everything we've been discussing so far, if you're only going to do one small thing slightly better, just pick one and do it really well and make sure it's properly embedded in your organisation or the process or your team ethic, if you like, first. So keep it really simple, I think. And the other, he again, he often reminded me that we should try and control the controllable. And I know many books have been oh, written about right. these sorts yeah. of things. But don't worry about stuff that's outside of your control. You know, The client's competitors doing something. Okay, but what are you going to do about that? What you can do is help your client to assert their agenda in the marketplace. What What's their market proposition? What message do they need to get through, irrespective of what the competition's doing? So mm. let's not get distracted by stuff we can't influence or affect. Let's focus on the things we can. Brilliant. Okay, so I am now going to go and dig out some of Michael Porter's texts, and I will find a book that has competitive advantage, and we will be giving away a copy of that text to one of our lucky winners. You know what to do if you get in touch on Twitter at Gunpowder Tweets using the hashtag SmallSparkTheory. Join in the conversation and we will pick a winner and send that book to you. Ian Johnston, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you very much. You have been listening to Small Spark Theory, brought to you by Gunpowder Consulting. Join in the conversation on Twitter at Gunpowder Tweets, hashtag Small Spark Theory. The podcast is created and hosted by me, Lucy Mann. Our editor is Claire Aban, and our producer is Isabel Jarvis. Music is provided by Duke Deck, available at dukedeck.com. For more information and to download further episodes, head to our blog at gunpowderconsulting.com. And if you like what you hear, head to iTunes and leave us a star.